Everyone wants the secret to a long life, and although there may not be just one, we do uncover some of those key elements in today's episode. Join me as I sit down with my 104-year-old friend, Krista Belknap, to glean some beautiful wisdom from her. Welcome to Health, Harmony, and Happiness with Kathy. I'm your host, Kathy Stricker. I'm a state patrol wife, mama to three lively kiddos, a yoga teacher, certified NLP coach, and an energetic rhythms expert. As an energetic rhythms coach, I help action-taking women use their body's rhythms and the moon's cycle to optimize productivity and avoid burnout without letting their desire to remain in control alter their focus. And this podcast is all about doing just that and perhaps a bit more so that you can create your own path to health, harmony, and happiness. So come along with me and may this episode serve as a nudge to discover tools that could help you on your path towards more intentional living. Enjoy the show. Hey friends, welcome to episode 93. Hey, if you are sick of waiting for things to change in your life, feeling like you're constantly pushing through life, thinking you just have to try a bit harder or maybe try a different approach, or like there's got to be a magic pill out there that you can take to just make life feel easier or to make your body feel better, the wisdom of your body might actually be trying to tell you something. And perhaps it's time to start listening. One of the best ways I know to do that is to actually start taking a realistic look at how you're really doing and what you're doing to might that might be making you feel that way. Being able to actually see how you're doing on paper is one of the best ways to get an accurate observation of what your inner guidance may be trying to tell you. That's one of the reasons I created the Daily Rhythms Journal, also known as the Daily Rhythms Tracker, to start to track and see the rhythms in your life so that you can start listening to what your higher self may really need instead of going 100 miles per hour, 100% of the time. To get started with the Daily Rhythms Journal, click the link in the show notes or visit karenyogawellness.com slash rhythms tracker and download your copy today. Today's episode is a long awaited one for me. Back in December, I sat down with my friend Krista Belknap to talk about the secret of life. Krista is 104 years old and still living and loving life. She lives at home still, attends regular meetings with philanthropic organizations she's involved with, as well as church gatherings. And her beautiful outlook on life, her compassionate nature, her adaptability and desire to continue learning are just some of the qualities that I believe have helped her live such a long life. I asked followers on Facebook a while back what kind of questions they might have for someone with this kind of wisdom. And the questions that were submitted were plentiful. And because of that, I've created two episodes out of our interview because we did have to divide the interview session into two sessions because we were talking so much. So that next episode will be part two of our So the next episode will actually be part two of our interview. Grab all the show notes at Karen Yoga Wellness slash podcast 93 and enjoy the show. Krista, thank you so much for being here today and for taking the time to sit down with me and chat. I have so many um, questions for you that have come from not only myself, but from other people who I have invited to be in on this process. So I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Well, I thank you for asking me. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's it's fascinating. My friend Krista Belknap is um, a dear friend, and I think I've known you, Krista, for probably over 10 years right. at least. Um, and you've got a lot of raving fans already, like I said, because I put this out on social media and said, I'm going to be interviewing my friend who just recently turned 104. And if you could sit down and ask questions to someone who's 104 years old and still living in their own home and doing things on their own, 
what would you want to ask? And the response was amazing. (laughs) I've been blown away by the amount of people who want to ask you questions and want to just get to know almost even what your secret sauce is, what the secret to living such a long and beautiful life is. So I'm hoping that you might be able to shed some light today on how you've lived your life and maybe some of those things that um, that are just nuggets of wisdom that you can give us who are who are out there still kind of wondering and filling our minds with with all the things and talking too fast, just like I usually do. <laughs> and you you kind of commented to me a moment ago that you've now slowed down and you probably don't talk or think that fast anymore. But I was I was chuckling because that's just how fast my brain goes sometimes. And uh, I think it's beautiful that you've allowed yourself and been able to slow down as you've aged and as as wisdom has become your friend. Um, and so I'm just curious and I want to know a little bit more about that. Are you okay with sharing some of your thoughts and insights with us today? Sure. Anything you ask, I'll try my best. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. Maybe my best is either slow, slower or slowest. (laughs) I think that's beautiful. You know, Krista, that in itself is a lesson that we all need to learn. And it's a lesson that I'll tell you has been one of my main messages in my business for so long is how to slow down. Slow down so that we can be more mindful, so that we can see the small things in life and zoom out and see the big picture. And I think we get that way the more we practice slowing down. So, I have been blessed to know Krista, like I said, for um, over 10 years. And I love that my kids now also get to be a witness to you and to your life. So if you wouldn't mind, would you just tell the listeners a little bit about yourself? And you don't have to tell your whole life story, but just kind of tell some of the highlights of your life. So we get an overview of who you are and then I'll go into some other questions. Well, first of all, I think I've been exceptionally blessed. Even God was watching out for me when I was born because I'm an adopted baby. And my parents always made me feel like I was just the best thing that ever happened to them which gives you much of confidence as a child and as an adult. Uh, We lived in Des Moines, Iowa, and uh, I went to school uh, at East High and graduated at East High. I married a man whose dream was to have his own jewelry store. And we were able to accomplish that. And that's what brought us to Knoxville, was to start a jewelry store here. And we were in the store for 35 years together. Incredible. Now, where was Jack from? Jack was born in Nashua, Iowa. Okay. His father... Go ahead. (laughs) Go ahead. You go. His father also was a jeweler, and he uh, early on recognized that Jack had that aptitude, and so he set up a place in their home where he could uh, bring watches to him and, and let him practice on them. So that was... Fascinating. Uh, yes, yes. Now, how I, did the two of you meet then? Actually, uh, we met in Des Moines. He had moved to Des Moines and was a stranger there, but lived in our neighborhood. And so we uh, happened to ride on the same public bus, you know. That's right. That's right. I remember you telling me this. Uh, and asked me for a date, you know, and I said, well, I don't know you from Adam. He said, well, I don't know you from Eve, but I'd like to get acquainted. <laughs> 
<laughs> I invited him to come and meet my parents. You know, before I said yes to a date, I thought, sure, let's see if he's serious, you know. <laughs> yeah. He was three years older than I, which uh, when you're 23 seems like a lot of years, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it sounds like you just had an amazing relationship with your parents to to be that one of the first things that you wanted to to do before you said yes to going on a date with someone to have them meet him and see if he was serious. What a beautiful, beautiful way of living. Oh, thank you. I yeah. thought, it, thought it was common knowledge. <laughs> well, maybe it was. It's certainly not the way it is today, is it? No. Things are quite different. <laughs> very different. Things are very yeah. different. Yeah. So if you're 104, what year were you born in? 1919. So amazing. So and amazing. Sometimes when uh, I fill out some kind of a, well, at the hospital, for instance, you know, when they ask you uh, your age, and when I say 1919, those young girls don't think 19 existed. You know, if it doesn't have a 20 on it, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> It confuses them a little bit, I would imagine. <laughs> right, right. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so you you um, met Jack. You got married. You Did you get married before you moved to Knoxville? Or did you move yes. to Knoxville? We, we were, this is a little bit of a long story. Um, Jack saw an ad in the Des Moines Register. Uh, a man in State Center, Iowa, wanted someone to run his jewelry store for him. He was an insurance person, but he bought a jewelry store, as was everything in it, you know, but didn't know what to do with it after he bought it. And so Jack answered the ad in State Center, Iowa, which is about 15 miles from Marshalltown. Yeah. So we, when we were married, then we moved to State Center from Des Moines. We moved to the uh -huh. I always thought it would be fun to, to live in a small town instead of a large town like, like Des Moines. But anyway, we were there two years. His grandmother lived in Knoxville and she kept telling him that we needed a jewelry store in Knoxville. She said, we have two jewelers, but they're both quite old and they're ready to retire. I think you should move to Knoxville. And we eventually did. Oh, in my 19, goodness. 1941, just before Pearl Harbor. 1941. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, so, I've been so you've here. been in Knoxville ever since. Right. So I know a awesome. lot. Of, a lot you sure do. Oh. You sure do, my goodness. And I think you've you've lived a pretty beautiful life from what I've heard and what I've experienced. And um, it's just amazing that you're still able to share your wisdom and, and share your light with the world because you have a light, Krista, and you are sharing it every time we get to see you, every time, every Sunday when I see you, every time I see you in a meeting, every time I see you out and about, you make my heart smile because sometimes I'll see you when you're coming out to get your hair done and I'm at the studio and I'll look out and I'll see you. Or when you would go to the dentist, maybe I would see you across the way and I would think, oh, there's Krista. And she just makes my heart smile because she's still getting out and getting around. Um, so thank you for that. You you inspire people in more ways than you you maybe even are aware of. Well, uh, yes, that's true. I was not aware. <laughs> You were watching me. <laughs> <laughs> not in a weird stalker way or anything, but it's kind of like a God wink. I'm not always up and looking out the windows, but just occasionally I'll just happen to look out the window and there you are. And I'm like, oh, hey, there's Krista. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know. It's just kind of a nice little connection. I think that God says, hey, remember this. Remember this. Live more like this woman. And speaking of that, um. What are some of the roles that you played over the course of your life? So, mom, um, what, what were some of the things that you did? 
in the community. You were a mom, you were a wife. What are some of the other things and the roles that you played? Oh, dear. I'd have to think about it. I think I belong to four organizations, which for, for over 50 years, you know. Incredible. The, like PEO and then a study club. And I've been active in my church all these years and love that. I've taught Sunday school from uh, teenagers. Some people didn't like to try the teenagers. So, <laughs> <laughs> teenagers, you know, and I, I had a class of uh, newlyweds one time, which was lots of fun. This is through church and you worked church. with them or taught them? This Beautiful. Church. Beautiful. Part. I just said, that's beautiful. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I love, yeah. And, um, I had a den of Boy Scouts when my son was like in third, fourth, and fifth grade is when, when they are Cub Scouts. And uh, even yet today, when some of those boys come home to visit their parents why they will either come by or call me. And I feel very blessed, you know, that, yeah. that hey, there's my dead mother. I went to a birthday party and, and he recognized me and he said, well, there's my dead mother. That's so, incredible. Now That's I know incredible. How, I know how teachers feel, you know, uh, when, yeah. When five years after they left school, they go by their house and wave at them. You know, that's those are some of the ideas of of living in a small town rather than living like a Des Moines or Chicago or St. Louis. For me, yeah. anyway, I like. Yeah, the- that's beautiful. Very fulfilling. What do you think the most fulfilling role is that you've played in life, or that you've had? Being active in my church, that's the most important. I love it. And and the church helps you be the kind of person that you want to be. I still enjoy my adult Sunday school class. I think there are a limited number of people that enjoy, still enjoy a class. I have always enjoyed my Sunday school class. What do you enjoy most about it? Probably the teaching. You know, we've been so fortunate. Uh, Right now, our teacher is a psychologist. And so we get some psychology mixed in with our Sundays, you know. and, And it's fun. And I enjoy it. And I left one of them in my class. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. You get some different perspectives then. And and I suppose as you have different teachers, different teachers bring different things, right? And different elements. And it helps make us more well-rounded and opens our eyes and opens our hearts to new things and new ways of being. Right. Right. So here's a question. How do you spend your time now? Pretty much the same, but just not as often, you know. For instance, uh, I have three ladies who help me. Uh, Like one person does shopping for me. One lovely, lovely lady volunteered uh, to take me to church on Sunday. She's a pretty incredible lady, isn't she? Yeah, when she volunteered, I'm sure she didn't think I was going to live for 10 more years. <laughs> oh, come on, you were driving. And she's right, here. <laughs> she's right here in the, she's right here in the, in the interview as well. So Kay is just, what a blessing. What yes. a blessing. Yes, she is. Krista, you were driving until you were in your late 90s. Oh, yes. <laughs> and I yeah, decided- let that be known. How old were you when you stopped driving? Do you remember? 
Must have been 98. 98. Uh, long in there. But I decided myself, my kids didn't have to tell me that I quit, should quit driving. And I really have not missed it. You know, some people are just frantic because they have to give up their car. I've never felt that way. Well, it's you our know? ability to have freedom. It's our ability, you know, to... Um... I mean, that's what we, that's what the mind ties it to is that ability to have freedom and to, to be independent. Right. Um, so yeah, I think it is hard for a lot of people. I, I think why wasn't it as difficult or challenging for you? I really don't know, but I, I felt when you try to load a walker into the back seat of a car and then and then walk up to the front seat when you have bad leg trouble, you know you're just asking for a fall, and I didn't want to fall. And I thought, well, it's not worth taking a chance. So I would rather depend on other people who can drive cars rather than well, fall and be in the hospital and so on, you know. What a beautiful perspective. What a beautiful perspective. Yeah. And it's probably a little cumbersome to have to um, load things like that into a car. So eh, make it a little bit easier on yourself. Right. Right. Your third person helps. You, you said shopping and driving and your third person. That would be your helper that comes in and on Saturday and helps Ruth. Oh, Ruth. Uh-huh. Yeah, Ruth. Tell about Okay. Ruth. And then you have someone who comes in on, on Saturdays to help you. Yes. Uh-huh. She helps That's me beautiful. with Gower first. She's a retired nurse, registered nurse, retired and had worked in uh, various hospitals, you know, for probably 40 years. Sure. He's 80. She's eight. Oh my gosh. Oh my goodness. Something like that. But anyway, then she's willing to stay and uh, like water my flowers that I can't reach. I'm short, you know. Yeah. And too many things I can't reach when I'm in the wheelchair. And sure. so she's willing to stay and she's a lovely, lovely person. Oh. And so God has really filled you up in so many ways. And, and made sure that you're supported and cared for mm-hmm. and that you can still doing the thing, do the things that are caring for others and giving back to others. That's right. So, right. So incredible. What brings you the most delight or even joy every day? And how has that changed over the years or has it changed over the years? Well, in some respects, yes, but, uh, I have a son and a daughter, and they have been always my life. They've been a joy and still are. My son calls me every day in the evening after he gets home from work. You know, and then the daughter, uh, we are in constant contact because we email and talk on the phone. You know, so my family you know, have been probably the greatest joy in my life. And then friends, friends that I make, you know, uh, have made my life feel very fulfilled. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And your son and daughter are pretty amazing people. I know I've gotten to meet them a few times and and spend a little bit of time with them, but... It's so cool that you connect with them and talk over email and you talk on the phone with them every day. And uh, that's just what a beautiful relationship that your parents taught you to have and to cultivate. And then you were able to pass that down to your children. And it was one of compassion and love and tenderness. And um, were there times in your life when your kids kind of wanted nothing to do with you when they were teenagers or when they were, you know, was that, was there a time in your life when they kind of pulled away? 
I really was not aware of that. If it happened, I don't know. So what, how did, what did you, how did you parent them? Um, so that that didn't happen. I think just with love. Oh. I just love. And I think with, because they always felt like, well, I, I felt with my parents that, that they were the most important thing in our lives, you know. And, and they still are. They still are. Yeah. Gosh, that is a beautiful message. That is just a beautiful message for anybody out there who is raising kids. And man, because it's hard. It's hard. <laughs> it's a it, lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of things that you don't imagine ahead of time. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they're but, busy. You know my kiddos, and you know Lulu. And Lulu is fire. And she's a little busy person. <laughs> something else, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy, she's going to do great things. Both of my children were you know, uh, amazed at her, you know, you know, how she gets what she wants, what Lulu wants, Lulu gets. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And we try, like, we put limits and we try to stop that. But, like, she is one determined little booger. She is, she is going after what she wants in this life. That's for sure. <laughs> well, it'll be interesting to see how she develops, you know, as she. Yeah. They're so fast. Yeah. Children are she's, so they are they are and she's been doing i've just noticed in the past few weeks that she has started to um respect boundaries a little bit more and she's really starting to like okay well if if we say no to something she's starting to grasp like oh okay well maybe we can do it next time yes maybe we can do it next time you know and i'm, I'm so glad that knock on wood knock on wood i'm so glad that she is starting to be a little bit um, more adaptable in those ways, I think. It appears to me that you are a wonderful mother. Well, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to switch gears just a little bit out of parenting. And um, like I said, everybody that I talked to about this kind of really just wants to know what your secret for living such a long and healthy life is. So if you've got the quick and easy answer, then <laughs> please share. <laughs> we'll share it with the world. But if not, then if you could reflect back on your life, what are some of the things that you attribute to living such a long life? I know you've mentioned God. I know you mentioned family. Um, what are some of the other things that maybe you can attribute to how you cared for yourself or how you... Um, you managed your health to live such a long life. Well, I think medical people will tell you that uh, heredity has something to do with it, you know. And of course, I know nothing about my parents since I was adopted. So yeah, the, the doctor said to me uh, in the beginning. Uh, like when my first child was born, she said, now, uh, since we don't know, you know, your heredity, uh, you watch your children. And if anything comes up, you know, that's serious, you be sure and let me know. Uh, well, nothing ever did. You know, and my children, evidently, they both, you know, inherited an easy life. Yeah, uh, doesn't that, but I wonder also, yes, genetics play a role. And also, we know that nurture plays a role too. And I wonder if there's some sort of link or connection to the fact that you really led with love and led with connection with your kids for their entire lives. And it just makes me wonder if on a cellular level, that amount of love and compassion can bleed into a person and and change their um, genetic outcome or cha change 
you know, so that their energetic level rises up to meet that which they are being nurtured yeah. with. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you're right. I, I think that probably fits into the equation. But I think, well, first of all, I think I was, I know I was uh, in probably seventh grade when I began to take my Or to be really serious about what I, how I felt about God, you know, and, and I wanted a relationship with him. And uh, also, I, I think how you, well, for instance, I decided long, early in my life, there, were, there was going to be no smoking and no alcohol. You know, I think uh, my teachers had such a effect on me, uh, both school teachers and Sunday school teachers, both, you know. I, I remember being in the third grade, we had what, what was called hygiene class in third grade. And I could remember, you know, just being fascinated by it what the teacher would tell us about white corpuscles and red corpuscles and that sort of thing. You know, <laughs> so, and, and, and at church, it was emphasized that your body is a temple of God. You should take care of it. You should do, destroy your body deliberately, you know. <sighs> Never was tempted to smoke or to drink. And of course, a lot of people think, you know, how can you have any fun without one or the other or both, you know? But yeah. I think yeah. it had something to do with my health. Yeah. I know my Absolutely. husband. My husband smoked, and, and, and I really feel like he would have lived 10 years longer if he had never, ever smoked, you know? Sure. Did he quit smoking at any point in time over the course of your life with him? Yes. Yes. Yeah. He began to be afraid that maybe he was getting lung cancer or something, you know, coughed a lot. Or yeah. So. And, uh, so he did add years to his life just by quitting smoking for sure. Yeah. But yeah, that would have been interesting to see. Huh. It was interesting because within three weeks after he quit, I heard him talking to our next door neighbor at the lake. We were at the lake fishing, and I heard him trying to talk her into giving up smoking. He told her how much better he felt, you know, and he was trying to talk her into giving up smoking, <laughs> which wow. amazed me, you know. Yeah. But I do he think, kind of became an advocate then for it. I do think the other adults in your life, besides your parents, have, have a great effect on how you take care of yourself, you know, and how you live your life and, and how you react to other people's love, you know. Yeah. Krista, when you worked at the newspaper in Des Moines, you were the model for exercise pictures. Yes, right. Do you want to tell about that? Yeah. Please do. Oh, my goodness. I have not ever heard this story. Oh, yeah. I After I uh, graduated from high school, it was all in the, the depression had a great effect on everybody's life. You know, everybody that I know. I suppose there were people who weren't affected by it. But... but uh, all of our friends, everybody that we knew, their life changed greatly because of, of the depression. Uh, but so I graduated from East High School and then I looked for a job. And I got a job at the Des Moines Register and Tribune in the syndicate department. And the syndicate department uh, had all the people that 
con- that contributed to the paper, but didn't that were, were not on the staff. You know, sure. maybe it came from various places. But anyway, uh, there was a woman, I think her last name was Lauman, and she had a piece in the uh, regularly in the paper called uh, Do Not Grow Old, I believe it was called. This has been a long time ago. I haven't thought about this in a while. But anyway, uh, along with the things that she wrote about taking care of yourself, there were pictures of somebody exercising. And I had always exercised all my life. I was a little bit like Lulu, you know. I think I, <laughs> if there wasn't anything else to do, I was out in the backyard doing cartwheels. And I've always liked to exercise. And I was still exercising in Knoxville three times a week uh, at the pool. I like to go to the pool. And so I exercised three times a week up till 95. That's and incredible. Yeah, the, uh, the lady that was in charge of seeing that that piece got in the paper every day uh, asked me if I if I would I was the youngest person in the department and she said would you pose for exercises I said sure I love to do her exercises the lady the Rhoda you know so that's how it happened it was a part of my job. That's incredible. What year would that have been? Or when when would that have been? What years, maybe? Well, I graduated in 1939. Oh, 30, okay. 37. I graduated in okay. 37. So it would have been 38, 39, 40. That is incredible. I was like that... 20, 22. I mean, you think about it. Exercise was not a big thing back oh. then. Was it? I mean, yeah. not not nearly as much, obviously, as it is now, but people did so much more manual labor. So I feel like it wasn't, it almost wasn't as necessary, right? Well, correct. Yeah, it wasn't advertised as much. But I always, in high school, we had a pool. Not every high school has its own pool. We had a pool. And so part of your phys ed was to me so many weeks every semester you had to go to the pool and of course a lot of girls you know oh they didn't want to get their hair wet they didn't so on but I I loved it I love going to the pool (laughs) uh, I love my physical class you know I, I never lied to get to get exempt you know some people sure. would buy them. you don't want to get sweaty in the middle of the day you don't want to yeah uh, i get it <laughs> oh you know yeah you go back to you go back to a class with your hair all wet you know don't look your best you know so. <laughs> yeah 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 i get it i get it Oh my goodness. Well, that's something we have in common. I didn't know. I, PE was probably one of my favorite classes for most of my life. And I loved, but that's why I went to school for exercise science because I loved the human body and how it could move and how you could, how you could just feel the energy when you moved. And, and, you know, I didn't know that at the time that that's what I was doing was moving energy and shifting things around. I just knew that it made me feel really good. And I liked moving and I liked being active. Um, that's beautiful. And, and you, you, you are still that way. I noticed when yeah. you were sitting on the floor, you went had one foot clear out there. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Um, were you there at church the day that I did a cartwheel down the aisle? Now say it again. <laughs> were you at church the day that I did a cartwheel down the aisle? Oh, no, no, no. I <laughs> oh, Krista, I wish you would have been there. We might have to find that on <laughs> on YouTube. It was the day we turn, we're turning in pledge cards, and um, Pastor Jamie was asking us to, like, dance basically down the aisle. And we had talked about this months ago. He was like, it would be great if you wanted to do cartwheels. So, of course, I didn't cartwheel down the aisle, I guess. I just cartwheeled in the front of the church. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> oh boy. Yeah. But, but that's, that's one of my goals in life is I still want to be doing cartwheels when I'm 60. So <laughs> I just got to keep doing it. <laughs> I, I used to think that too. I think if I, if I do this every day, to, you know, till I die, I'll still be able to do it. But you get too involved in too many things. You know, you don't get the every day. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Sometimes you go through seasons where you just have to do what you can, right? And even if it's just a little bit, um, a little bit of priority time for yourself every day, it's better than than nothing, right? And priority time looks a little bit different for everybody. Sometimes my priority time is just the time that I'm spending with God and I don't have time to to move my body as intentionally as I would like to. Um, sometimes it's sitting and journaling. Sometimes it's getting together with friends and socializing. But most every day, my priority time also involves some sort of intentional movement. What about you? What are the things that you do or have done over the years to connect with yourself and to make nurturing yourself a priority? Well, I think maybe my, just my desire to attend church regularly, you know, and, and to study my Sunday school lesson and enjoy the conversation that goes on between people who are serious about their relationship with God, you know. Yeah. 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 What's the hardest belief that you've had to let go of in life that ended up maybe helping you the most? For instance, you used to think this way, but when you finally realized you needed to let that way of thinking go and start thinking another way, it ended up helping or changing the course of your life dramatically. I would have to think about that a while. It's a tricky one. Oh, it is. It is. Maybe I give up things easier than some people. I don't know. Just like my car, you know. Yeah. yeah. Maybe maybe I don't become as attached. But I think I'm that attached to my home. See, I'm fighting now to, to keep my home and not ah. have to go to a nursing home. And I, I still do simple exercises. I have to do them in bed. You know, I can't get up and, up and down on the floor. Yeah. But I do exercises in bed, and I do exercises uh, because I have arthritis, and I'm not able to do the kind of exercises I used to do. But yeah. uh, I still do exercises night and morning. And so still the, taking care of yourself. Well, I had to give up going to the pool, see. Uh, but I realized there was no way I could do it from now on, you know. At five, I was 95 when, when, my, when my knee just would not support me anymore. And it wasn't anything surgery could correct. You sure. Know? So I had to be in the wheelchair. It sounds like you're just such an incredibly adaptable person. And you have been able to realize that just as much as we want to be able to invite new things into our lives, we also have to let go of things that are no longer serving us. And it seems like maybe that's a quality that's come fairly easy to you over the years. Evidently. You know, you, it's beautiful. It just happens, and you really don't know. You know. Yeah. But, That's beautiful. But I think Let's I'm. See. I'm a happy. I tell my kids I'm a happy camper. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. So, what do you believe oh. your purpose is or was in life? Do you still believe that you have a purpose? Well, love, I think, I think maybe love is 
of everything, you know, nature, which God has provided um, our our attachment to our friends and neighbors, uh, relatives. I just and and trying to trying to remain a cap, happy camper with whatever I has chosen to throw in your way, just to be able to accept it, you know. I think it's important. Yeah, I think so many times it can it could be easy to get stuck and to dwell on either what we don't have or how things are changing or um, keeping something that we really desire or really want. But it sounds like you're saying part of that secret is to be able to trust the process of life, to be able to surrender to this um, higher energy force, which we call God, and trust his plan over our own plan. And it sounds like you really were able to embrace that thought and idea from a young age so that it could lead you into your life and and help you go with the flow even more. Well, thank you. Yeah. What a beautiful quality. I hope that I impress people that way. It, yeah, well, it's just I, incredible to me, Krista, how you have just led with with love over the years. And in doing so, it has brought so much togetherness instead of division in your life. And I want to thank you for continuing that purpose on in life and sharing your light with the world because it's a light and a message that needs to be heard right now. We are in such a world of division and everybody wanting to be right in their own way. And you bring this message and this beautiful light that says, let's look at all sides. Let's just lead with love. And, and it brings people together. So thank you for that. Well, thank for you. For reminding us. Mm-hmm. And I think you're well on the way to, to being the kind of person you want to be. Hmm. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Okay, friends, that's all I've got for you today. Part two of our interview will be coming out in just a couple weeks. So stay tuned because Krista has so much more goodness to share with you. I hope that you have enjoyed listening to her as much as I enjoyed just sitting in and slowing down and being still to to listen to what she had to say. I know she's got a lot of stories to tell. And part of my reason for doing this episode or these episodes is because I want to preserve that. I want to be able to preserve some of this beautiful woman's journey through life and be able to share that because as we said in the podcast, so often we forget to slow down. We forget to be still and we forget to just tune into what's really important, what's really essential. And that's family and that's taking care of yourself and not overdoing it, not um, burning yourself out, but instead tuning in to what your body's wisdom can tell you, tuning into what you need the most. That's all I've got for you today. Uh, I will see you next time. I'm Kathy Stricker, and you've been listening to Health, Harmony, and Happiness with Kathy. Cheers to cultivating a global impact through health, harmony, and happiness.